So, uh, hello everyone. First of all, I would like to apologize because I broke my PC two days ago and I bought a new one and I must admit it's a piece of shit. So I hope it's, um, it's going to work well. So, uh, yes, my name is Fred. Uh, I've been programming in Java for the last uh, 20 years, actually. Um, was getting a bit bored, but I must admit last year I discovered, um, well, I knew about blockchain. I think everybody knows about blockchain here. But uh, last year we, um, I discovered about uh, the Ethereum blockchain, which is one of the latest one, and more particularly the smart contract concept of uh, that blockchain, which is very, very interesting. But um, smart contracts are still programs, and we still have the same problem as any other programs, uh, especially when it comes to testing and uh, doing the integration of the change we are making with potentially all other software we would be using with that <coughs> smart contract. So I thought it would make sense to develop something and, well, share it with, uh, with you guys. So first of all, I would like to briefly come back on the blockchain concept. I know probably most of you have a knowledge of uh, uh, how the blockchain is working, but sometimes I think it makes sense to bring everyone at the same level. Uh, most probably a lot of you won't learn anything, but at least we will be uh, at the same level. Then smart contracts, we'll talk a little bit about that. And then we will go to the real topic of this presentation, the continuous integration and deployment <coughs> of uh, smart contracts. So when you think about the blockchain, fundamentally it's the combination of three things. A ledger, such as the one you find in accounting, so a big book where you store transaction. The only difference is that we are dealing with uh, uh, digital assets instead of uh, monies or stocks or th things like that. And also the notion of transaction in the ledger for us IT people, um, in the case of the blockchain, it makes more sense to talk about something which is an invocation. We are invoking, we are storing <coughs> invocation information in that ledger. Then for the second concept I think it's important is I put the Napster logo for those who remember that, but it's the peer-to-peer -peer network. I put Napster because it was probably the first major application that was using peer-to-peer uh, -peer communication. And then um, the third group of concepts, let's put it like that, uh, that is used in, uh, in blockchain is the, uh, everything related with cryptography, so all the cryptographical technology behind. Again, I'm not going to go into the details about all this, but I think we will have some kind of bare minimum, <coughs> sorry, uh, to start building the rest. So when I was talking about the ledger, yes, it's a, it's a big book. Usually you are running it or you are storing it on a node. Uh, for example, I can run a node here which would participate to the, to the, the, the blockchain. Uh, but I have on my machine the entire ledger available. So it's copied. This is what it looks like. Well, it's the peer-to-peer -peer network. You have a bunch of computers uh, uh, connected all together with, with the internet. They can talk to uh, uh, one to the other without a central server. This is the, the whole idea behind peer-to-peer -peer communication. There is no central centralized server. There is no central uh, point of control. And the last bit is the cryptographical uh, uh, techniques which allows, for example, to avoid, as we have access to uh, the ledger on every machine participating to the network, well, at some point I can say, well, I will write in the ledger a transaction which gives me all the available assets, digital assets on the, the chain, and I will become the owner of that. Of course, this is, of <laughs> this is something which is uh, not very good, so thanks to all those cryptographical technologies, techniques, if you try to do that, if you try to insert a transaction which would break the rules of the ledger, this transaction will at some point be cancelled because uh, several nodes will come to a consensus and say, well, 
this transaction not good, so we won't include it in the in the, the, the distributed ledger. So globally, it gives us uh, a unique ledger available, keeping track of digital assets, keeping track track of invocation done on those assets. An invocation is, for example, a transfer when you are moving one assets from one column to the other, that's a transfer, it's an invocation. Uh, this ledger is, is distributed on all those nodes, on all the participating nodes, and if we have rogue nodes trying to do uh, bad things on the, the ledger, it will be detected and those transactions will be cancelled. So, you probably realized that we have a lot of computers, we have network connectivity, those computers you need to put electricity, you need to store them somewhere, we have storage as well. So who is paying, basically? Who is paying the, uh, this blockchain uh, infrastructure? Well, actually, and this is why I would wanted to <coughs> make a brief presentation about the blockchain, everybody thinks that the blockchain is the Bitcoin. Everybody has an, uh, a, a belief that the only purpose of a blockchain is to have cryptocurrency. And that cryptocurrency is going to replace the normal currency that we are using to, uh, every day. The idea of the cryptocurrency is in fact to be able to pay for service available on the chain. The initial idea was not to use it as a way to exchange uh, values among people. You can do it, but it was not the initial idea. So uh, this is why we have cryptocurrencies on blockchains. In general, you have the Bitcoin on the Bitcoin blockchain. In the case, in my case here, <coughs> I'm using the Ethereum blockchain, and the currency is called the Ether in that case. And um, one of the important points about those uh, cryptocurrency, uh, the if you want to pay for those services with a normal currency, implicitly you would give control to a state or an organization. So that's why th those cryptocurrency have to, they have to emerge at some point out of the blockchain. This is why you have to mine them, for example. This is why you probably heard about people running a lot of machines trying to mine to find uh, Bitcoin or Ether. But in fact, what they do is they are simply processing transactions, invoking things, invoking little, <coughs> little function on the blockchain. And once in a while, they get paid for that. So the value of a cryptocurrency on the blockchain is basically depending on, well, I have uh, six here, yeah. So the feature available on the blockchain, what can the blockchain provide to you in terms of service? The cost of computer. Uh, if you want to run a, a mining rig, most probably you will have to have a little Excel and put the cost of a GPU card and all these th th kind of things. The cost of connectivity in certain countries, well, it's very expensive to, to get connected to, to the internet. Storage as well, you have to store a lot of data when you are running a node, so the cost of a hard disk is also important. Energy, uh, energy is probably the biggest, uh, has the biggest share in terms of costs when you are considering a mining blockchain, and to a certain extent interest rate as well, but I'm not going to go into that because it's not really, first of all, it's not that important and it's a bit technical. So I've been talking about buying service, but what are they? And then it leads us to the smart contract bit. So the smart contract is it's a piece of code. We are going to see one later on. Um, it is not a software, it's not an application which is running um, somewhere, um, launching threads and being available, uh, receiving requests and all these kind of things. No, it doesn't work like that. It is activated when it is invoked. So when a transaction is sent, when an invocation is made, on that smart contract, the smart contract gets activated. It is executed by a virtual machine, a virtual machine in the sense of it is not a Java virtual machine, but it is not a VMware virtual machine, this is what I want to say. For example, in the Ethereum world, 
they have the Ethereum virtual machine, which is able to interpret uh, Ethereum bytecode. The smart contract itself is stored in the ledger. When I said before that the ledger could hold uh, digital assets, well, a smart contract is a digital asset as well. When you are deploying a smart contract, it costs money because it takes some space. At some point, it needs some uh, processing power, so you will have to pay for it. How do you pay for that? Again, you use a cryptocurrency attached to that particular blockchain. When you want to read um, states or va variable field located in a, in a smart contract, it's free. For a simple reason, as I've said before, all the ledger is distributed. So if you are running a node on your machine, at some point, you will have an entire copy of the ledger. So you can access states. You can just read what's written on your, on your hard disk to have some information. That's free. If you write things, uh, so if you're changing the state of a smart contract, then implicitly it will need to be propagated everywhere. So it will need to be verified. It will need, the, the network will need to reach a consensus and that costs money. So you would, you might say, okay, well, fair enough. Um, <coughs> I just write a smart contract and uh, I just make a, a function, and inside the function, I write while true. Am I going to make the entire network shut down? Because all the virtual machines are going to run like crazy and will never stop executing that smart contract. And this is one of the concepts which got in introduced by the Ethereum blockchain in comparison to the Bitcoin one. Bitcoin doesn't have that. Perhaps they will in the, in the future, but I don't think so. It's the concept of gas. If you are executing, if you are sending a transaction to a smart contract on the Ethereum blockchain, you have to attach a little quantity of gas to that transaction. And when the execution will start, the gas will be consumed progressively by the virtual machine. And if it reaches zero, then your transaction won't get executed until it's, uh, it is finished. So if at some point of your transaction, it reaches its end and we still have some gas available, then it's fine and the remaining gas will be sent back to the uh, initiator of the transaction. For example, in this case, we have uh, someone, a party, a person, a computer, whatever, sending a transaction to its own node. The node will have that replicated, I mean, it will be replicated to the entire network and a little quantity again, in the cryptocurrency attached to this, uh, to this chain, will be allocated to the transaction uh, uh, that we want to execute. The virtual machine which is going to mine that transaction will start using the, the gas available, and if everything goes well, it will consume part of the gas available, and when it is finished, the remaining bit is sent back to the initiator. <clears throat> so, in this case, now I would like to go into, uh, I mean, to demonstrate a very small smart contract, so you get an idea of how it works and uh, what it can do. Uh, you are probably aware about the concept of escrow. Um, it's, uh, it was very famous at the beginning of the internet. It's still, if you have, I don't know in Bulgaria, I think you have notary as well. The notary plays usually uh, a, a, a role of an escrow when you buy a house. Uh, so it keeps the money to make sure that you get the house and the other person gets the money. So usually you have three peoples and the, <coughs> the terminology calls, I mean, define them as a principal, so the person who is basically sending money and expecting something in return. When I say money, it can be any digital assets. Then you have the auditor. In the case of a notary, the notary would be considered as the auditor, playing the auditor role. And then you have a beneficiary. Beneficiary could be, I don't know, someone who is uh, supposed to provide you a service or to sell you goods. The whole point is that the principal will give some funds or digital assets, whatever, something which has value, 
to the auditor, and the auditor will control that the beneficiary is delivering goods or service. If it does, then the money will be transferred to the beneficiary. If it doesn't, then the money will be sent back to the principal. Again, uh, we can go into much more complicated uh, definition of escrow with additional parties involved, in, but this is not the point here. It's not a, a law course. Uh, this is only a case that I thought would make sense to, to show you. In the blockchain world, in the smart contract world, the, the three parties would still be there. So we have the principal, we have the auditor, we have the beneficiary. Each of them will have an account on the blockchain. Then you have the smart contract in the middle. The smart contract has also an address. You can send money to the smart contract. He will happy, happily uh, take them, but keep them for himself. Uh, it is something that is completely comparable to another participant uh, in the blockchain. The smart contract here will be invoked when the, 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 the principal will send some fund to the smart contract. And then the auditor, when he, he, he sees that the, the beneficiary realized his promise, so delivered goods, uh, so on and so forth, he will, uh, he will uh, allow the smart contract to deliver the fund to the beneficiary, or if it's not the case, send it back to the principal. The auditor at no point has access to the money himself, it just has the role of accepting the delivery or not. He never held the money uh, at any point. The money is really held by the, the smart contract. I've made a little, an additional smart contract here. It has a strange name, ERC20. Actually, ERC20 is um, it's a, a standardized API from the Ethereum uh, blockchain, which allows you to define digital assets, so a common interface for digital assets, to transfer them, to uh, check the balance you have, these kind of things. If you use this interface in your smart contract, it means that any digital assets that will respect that API could be involved in that smart contract. So let's have a look at the code. Where is it? Oh, here. Um, I skip the first line. I will actually, we can have a look. Um, this is the definition of the ERC contract that I was just mentioning before. So again, uh, this is completely standardized. It's not something which came out of my, my mind. Uh, if you implement token using that contract, automatically you have a bunch of wallets that you can hold, that, that would be able to hold uh, uh, what you interact with, with uh, that kind of token. You can imagine a lot of things. You can Im imagine tokens that are representing a bonus point that you get uh, in, in, a, in a shop. You can, I don't know, uh, for example, I have a little prototype where we are trying to sell uh, watts per hour for people having electric car. So we, we are using an ERC-20 contract uh, for the people that to, to, be a, to allow them to store uh, a certain quantity of watt per hour and to spend it if they want to reload their car. So for example, the first method gives you an idea of the entire supply available of token. You can ask the balance for yourself, I mean, for an owner. You can transfer uh, funds, you can transfer from if you have the right to, approval, allowance, etc. I will not get into the details. The one we are most interested in, I mean, we, we are interested in the balance of and transfer. Th this is the two methods that we are going to use in our smart contract. So this is my contract itself. As you could imagine, we called it uh, escrow contract. We have our three parties here, and they are represented by their address. Uh, and then we have a reference towards the R ERC20 token that we want to use in that particular contract. A little description, well, it's to keep track of uh, what this contract is about. Um, in, oh, yes, I forgot to say the language that, I, uh, that we are using here, it's called Solidity. As you can see, it's 
for it. So kind of C-like contract uh, so language, uh, pretty straightforward to understand. Um, this is uh, what they call the modifier. I'm not going to enter into the de details of uh, the modifier because you will see what it's used uh, for later on. This method, in fact, is the, the constructor of the contract. So when you are deploying a contract on the chain, you will have to give uh, several information, such as who is the beneficiary, so the person who ultimately will get uh, the money, who is the auditor, of course, the auditor, you need to, to agree with the beneficiary uh, on the auditor, because if you take a friend of yours, it doesn't make any sense. Then the address of the token contract, and the description I was talking about uh, before. The principle, because we have also the, the principle that needs to be defined, when you are instantiating the contract on the chain, the principle will be actually the one who sent the transaction. So, there is uh, some context contextual um, object available in any contract, and one of them being the message that got, that got sent to the blockchain to create the contract. And there is a field called the sender, which is, of course, the person who sent the contract. So we take the, uh, we, are assuming, we are assuming that the principal is the person who sent the contract. We are copying the value. I think it's pretty obvious, and here, um, this is, it, well, actually, it's a casting, to make it simple. It's really what you would do uh, in Java by a, by a casting. You have the, the contract address. You cast it to the real interface of, uh, of the, the, the underlying contract, so you can call the methods on it. The, when the contract gets created, as I was saying, it gets an address, so it's like any other parties available on the, on the blockchain. So the second step that the uh, initiator of the operation would do is to send token to the contract, so to give the money to the, the, the contract, the digital assets that are supposed to be kept in escrow, he will send that to the contract. This is not an operation which is part of the contract itself, it's done separately simply by doing a transfer with your wallet. Oh, my contract address is uh, one, two, three. Okay, we agreed with the beneficiary, I need to pay him 10 J prime. So I'm going to make a transfer of 10 J prime to my contract and the contract will hold that fund. This method here will simply allow the caller, as long as the caller is either the auditor, the sender, the, the principal, or the beneficiary, to be sure or to check the balance available of the digital assets that got uh, in escrow. So who, um, how much digital assets does the contract hold? And to have that information, we are calling the token interface balance of and we give the address of the contract, because this is what we are interested in. How much token does the contract hold? You remember this modifier I mentioned before? This is where it's used. It's to simplify, it's to make, well, actually it's to avoid having uh, replicated code all over the place when you want to check something uh, very regularly. And in the case of smart contract, most of the time you want to verify that, that the caller has a right to call a particular function. So in this case, release funds can only be done by the auditor. We don't want anyone else to release the funds. So if the auditor is indeed calling that method, the code will be executed. Otherwise, the code will be, the, the method will, will not be invoked. First operation, we are retrieving the balance again. Then we are invoking the uh, ERC20 interface and telling, okay, I'm transferring to the beneficiary the balance. And the last operation is, well, we don't have to do anything else anymore in the contract. So the contract suicide itself. It says, well, I'm, I'm done. I, I don't need to do anything else. 
suicide. Um, when you do suicide, you have to specify an address. And what's happening is any fund held by the contract, any fund in, in ETA held by the contract will be sent back to the, the principal. Return funds, again, can only be executed by the auditor. Here we have the operation that the auditor would call if he's not happy with the delivery of goods or service by the beneficiary. So exactly the same code here. But instead of transferring to the beneficiary, he sends the money back to the principal and then suicide itself. This method here, it's called the anonymous uh, method. This is actually the method which is called when the contract receives ETA. As I was saying, you can transfer ETA to the contract. This is the method that would be called if you do that. Uh, usually we do nothing, we just thank, say, oh, happy, thank you very much, we have some ETA more. And this, uh, this is the ETA that got sent to the contract via this method that would be sent back to the principal if uh, the contract reached an end. So this is the, why the suicide method, this is what the suicide method would do. Any, uh, do uh, is there any question for the contract? Because I know, it, for me it's quite logical, but it's probably new for a lot of you. return the money. So uh, my question is, uh, is the contract as an instance something that is initiated per transaction or is a, like a definition that you put into the ledger and whenever you want to uh, pay to, to somebody, this contract will automatically... Oh, in fact, there is one instance per contract. So for example, if we have a deal between us two and uh, the auditor is this gentleman, we will create an instance for our operation. And there would be another instance if someone else want to do the escrow. So the, 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 the code of the contract uh, can be, for example, sold to you by a company. You can imagine to have companies in the future that are going to tell you, okay, we can sell you an escrow contract. Give us who you are, who is the beneficiary, who is the, the auditor, we instantiate it for you and we make you the owner of the contract. But it will be an instance. The code itself, you can do it by yourself if you're happy. But we, uh, for example, the, the, there is a lot of expectation that some company will start providing those contracts and famous companies such as, uh, you know, uh, uh, Aston Young, uh, those big uh, uh, KPMG, because they're well known, they are playing the role of auditor. We're expecting that at some point they will become very active on the, the, the smart contract uh, landscape by selling to you instance of those contracts. I see. So, so okay. Thank you. Uh, just, just as a, it was a conceptual question. So, the contract is really a representation of just the rules of, a of, of uh, the process of payment between. We, me in fact, if perhaps you know what I suggest is that uh, you wait for the, the next step of the presentation because I cool. think it will clarify a lot of things. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Anybody? So, I move forward? Okay. So, I go back quickly um, to show, well, something that most of you probably have seen in a different shape, but it's a typical continuous integration circle. And this is the one uh, I will show you here because, of course, there is a lot of different software to do uh, automated build. There is a lot of different uh, application to store artifact. There is a lot of uh, different uh, source control. But in my case, I'm using Git, I'm using Jenkins, and I'm using uh, Archiver. So this is uh, how what is going to be demonstrated. Here I have a little sauna stuff, but it doesn't make much sense in, uh, in our case. So as you probably know, this, this is me. I'm uh, just a little bit more hairy. But when I'm committing code in Git, then it will trigger uh, a, a new build on my Jenkins server. So Jenkins will clone, will try to compile, will try to run um, tests, 
and if everything is fine, it will make a jar and will deploy it in, our, in uh, Archiva, and those jar would be uh, available uh, to me and to, any to anyone else having access to that Archiva. Uh, the underlying technology is Maven for the build. I'm not using Gradle, I'm using Maven. And um, uh, when you think about what do we need in order to uh, include smart contracts into that schema, we need to be able to compile them, we need to be able to package them, we need to be able to deploy them, so to really create an instance of the blockchain of the contract, and we need to interact with the, the contract themselves. So as I was saying, for the compilation, the packaging, and the deployment, I'm using Maven, so uh, I wrote a little plugin which would be included into a POM file. And for the interaction, there is this little framework that I'm using, which is called eDuke. When you know Duke, it was here before, and E is for Ethereum. So I can show you how it looks like. I'm not sure that this one will be, we need to increase the. Uh, okay. Is it readable? Yeah? Okay. So, if I'm looking into my, uh, my POM file, it's a very typical POM file. I have a parent, I define the, the name of my artifact, I have a couple of options and so on. I have no dependency. This is the POM file for the compilation of the smart contract. No, no dependency in this case. Then I have my plugin, which in fact will attached to the compilation phase of uh, Maven. So concretely, what hap what's happening here? So if I do a Maven clean, oh, sorry, that's not the right project. So if I do a Maven clean, and if we look at what we have, I'm gonna decide all this shit. Uh, if we look at the source part, we can see that we have the escrow contract, the one I showed you before. The target is empty because I've just cleaned the, the, uh, the project. So if I do a Maven clean install, typical Maven stuff, it's done. So if we look at the target now, what's happening is we have um, we have a directory called eduke inf, and in it we can find those four files. We have the bin file, which are the real, the real representation of the contract in the Ethereum uh, uh, virtual machine bytecode. If we have a look, for example, this. It's a, it's a string, but of hexadecimal representation. There is also an ABI. The ABI concept is basically uh, a JSON file, which is giving uh, an interface, the interface of the contract. So if you, if you look at those things, you have all the methods that we mentioned uh, before in the contract that are available. And this is the way Ethereum decided to publish interface of contracts is via a JSON definition. So um, I have those files, and also they got packaged into a jar, why not? And this jar, if we are, I mean, right now it's installed on my local Maven repository. If I come briefly back to my Jenkins server, same stuff, except that I have a task here, that I can, I can actually run it 
but I can also have it run if I do a commit on my contract. So if I change my contract and I commit it, the, uh, the, the, the build will be automatically called. We will do that afterwards. The, the second bit is the integration test itself. Where, in fact, this is done in Java, so it's a Java class. Actually, I know it might sound counterintuitive, but I'm using JUnit to do integration tests. I know JUnit is for unit tests, we all agree about that, but I find it very well integrated with Jenkins. So if we are running, if we are triggering the initiation of uh, integration tests by simply calling the first interface of our entire system and checking if on the other side we have the expected result. The good thing is if something goes down or goes wrong, we have proper, proper statistic inside Jenkins. It's very well integrated. So this is why I'm using it like that. If I go to the source code, This is, for example, a test which would verify that the, uh, the sent token to the contract worked. So those methods, for example, are available in the, in the framework that I'm using. This is the unlock account, so it allows to make operation out of an account, so the, 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 the any, every call that will be made afterwards will be made on behalf on, of someone specific. So in this case, I'm using the principal address, his passwords, and it means now that every operation that I'm doing will be done on behalf of the principal. And the principal in this case will uh, send some uh, fund to the, uh, uh, sorry, will send to the token contract uh, an order to transfer, transfer, to the escrow contract, five unit of the token. This method here is also a helper available in the framework to encode uh, th those information and to send it to the, uh, to include it in the transaction to be sent to the blockchain. The token contract binary interface, this is this ABI file that I was mentioning before. It exists also for the RSC 20 token, so this is how basically the encoding will be made, will make sure that uh, the, the methods and also the parameters that are passed are properly encoded according to the definition of the contract. Then we are sending the transaction here. We get a response and then we do any assertions we want. Uh, do we have a response? As, is it okay, yes or no? If something goes wrong at that point, it means, well, we had a problem. Second step, the auditor will call and verify if the contract is holding indeed the, uh, the, the fund that uh, we are expecting. So in this case, I'm unlocking the account of the auditor, not the, the, the principal anymore. Again, a transaction from the auditor address. Now I'm sending, I'm asking something to the contract so the destination is the contract. And in this case, the data will be get amount in escrow. So one of the function available in the contract. There is a slight difference here. We see we have the transaction here and here we have a call. The difference is here when we are sending money to a contract, we are changing the status of the blockchain. So it has to be done via transaction. Whereas here we are reading a field, the value of a field, it's a, it's a read-only operation, it's a read operation. So we don't need to send a transaction, we just need to read what's available in the chain. So it's done via um, a call. So we are verifying, do we, is it, do we have a, a non-null response? Does it have an error? And does, it, does the JSON response contains a certain numbers of things uh, proving that the balance is uh, what we are expecting? And it goes on and on and on like that. 
In this case, the auditor released the fund, so unlock the account of the auditor, the transaction. Again, it's a transaction here because we are changing the status of the blockchain. And in this case, we are uh, invoking the release fund uh, methods. If we look at the POM file of the integration test, there is something interesting in it. So again, we have a little bit more dependency in this case because it's a, it's a Java application, so we have a lot of, uh, of thingy. The interesting bit here is uh, this plugin. It's again the, the eduke Maven plugin, but before we were using it to compile a contract, in this case we are using it to deploy the contract. So deploying, and then I come, I, I come back to, to, to your question, uh, we need to provide the binary representation, so the, 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 the bytecode of the contract, and we are telling, uh, we are asking the plugin to use this account, which is the, the principal account in this case, very secure password. We give some gas as well because we are expecting we need to pay for this deployment. So I give 250,000 uh, gas, which is probably uh, four times what we need, but better safe than sorry. And then this plugin will basically hook himself in the process resource of the Maven um, uh, phase management, whatever it's called. And it will call the deploy operation of the plugin. An interesting bit when you do that, and we are going to do it straight away, um, I think it's like this, I don't remember. Is it like that? Is there any specialist in Maven confirming it's the right order? No specialist of Maven, so let's give it a shot. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, I forgot something. I forgot to hook myself into my, uh, my node. Let's give him one, one more shot, otherwise we have a look in the log of the uh, of uh, Jenkins because everything is there as well. Ah, here we go. So, I'm going to stop it here. What you just saw here, in fact, is the call to the node that we are running on the server I just got uh, connected to. And we are sending a transaction, but it's a special transaction because in fact the data is the bytecode of my smart contract. You see, I, I have my uh, initiator address here, uh, I have my value of gas, and in the data I put the binary, or, well, the binary version of the smart contract. And it gives you a transaction hash as a return, and this is how we would retrieve the address of the contract, because this is key, of course, in this integration, is how do we get that information back? So when I'm deploying my contract, thanks to the transaction, I can now locate my contract and start invoking it. And thanks also to this um, integration with um, Maven, 
I can reference, because here in my dependency, I have my contract, because we used Maven to, to compile it and to package it, so we can reference it via a Maven uh, dependency. So it means that my binary version, I've used here an additional plugin to extract it out of my, uh, uh, of my uh, dependency, and I reference it from the plugin, uh, the, the edu plugin for the deployment. So this is how I'm able just to take the result of my uh, compilation and packaging and use it into the, uh, the deployment. When it's deployed, I have the address. When I have the address, I can start the, uh, the tests. So now if I simply make a little change here, and I commit my change, I push it, something magical should happen, hopefully. So here we go. In the build queue, we see that the, the contract, as it got changed, will be recompiled. In this case, of course, we are not adding any new functionality, but as you can imagine, we could have. So the contract is going to be uh, recompiled. The uh, result will be repackaged, so the ABI and the bin. Uh, in a jar. The jar will be published on uh, Archiva, and thanks to Jenkins and its integration with Maven, this is why I'm not using Gradle actually, the integration with uh, Maven is great with Jenkins. Jenkins will realize that one of the dependency of the test integration project just got changed and will uh, start that task as well. So the task will take the new version of the contract, deploy it on the chain, and start the, uh, the integration test automatically. So the whole idea was, uh, as I was saying, the I really believe that this smart contract stuff will has a lot of value. It's also difficult to find a proper usage for, for them, but uh, a lot of companies are progressively uh, using them. Uh, but we also need to have a proper environment to test them because it's, it's a software. We need to guarantee that what we are delivering is of high quality. And this is what, what is the purpose of uh, this framework, in fact. Any question? Uh, excuse me. What is your opinion about the future of uh, open blockchains like Ethereum and Blink Bitcoin and uh, some private uh, blockchains? For example, there's the A3 consortium. Do you think that uh, the open uh, standards can uh, win uh, in uh, this corporate world? Well, it, it would be very presumptuous for me to, to tell you this is what's going to happen, but I can give you at least my hunch. Um, I, I, fundamentally think that the, the future of blockchain will be in hybrid blockchain, not in public one, not in private one, but in really hybrid one. So for example, in the banking sector, you probably heard about company like Swift, Euroclear, Clearstream, those guys are typically in the middle of everything. I think they will disappear. And banks are going to run their own hybrid blockchain to exchange information, but without a centralized group. That's my feeling. Just one last question. Uh, have you selected Ethereum or the classic, Ethereum classic version, and uh, why? Because there are, at the moment, two well, basically <laughs> concurrent blockchains. It, it was a gigantic cock-up, uh, this uh, DAO shit, but, uh, well, <laughs> that's part of the game. Yeah, I was able to think out of two questions. Uh, there, there, there are oh, a lot of questions, please. but... I was made uh, made two of them. So um, first, uh, is it? Can you just confirm? Is is the, the statement right that uh, transferring money between two parties uh, using smart contracts actually uh, can can be be said that it it is a, a multiple uh, 
multiple times, uh, a, a su such a smart contract instance, in terms of just of code encoding, just such kind of an object, smart contract would be instantiated. Uh, it will do some things. The, the, these things, the output of the initiation of those contracts uh, will be recorded on the ledger and on each su su next invocation of, of uh, because we are transferring money with, uh, between me and you, let's say. So the uh, first time I am transferring to you, but the transaction is not uh, completed yet. So uh, this means that someone instantiated such smart contract, it does its job and then was su suicided. Uh, but the output of this smart contract was recorded in the ledger. That's why later consequent uh, invocations in the same context, context they will actually read the ledger. Is this is this correct? Is this the actually the the uh, flow? Th the ledger is indeed public, so uh, any information that got recorded remained there, unless the information that you stored would have been encrypted, or unless you use certain. Th there are a couple of. Uh, uh, cryptographical technique that guarantees some kind of uh, anonymity, but uh, well, it's it's not really the topic of uh, of, of this presentation. But uh, 